If you were to ask me, Dave, have you ever beaten Donkey Kong Land 3 for Game Boy? I would have responded, eh, maybe? I think so? I don't know. I love the first game in the series, Donkey Kong Land. I've played through the whole game many times and have great memories of it. And I really enjoyed the sequel, Donkey Kong Land 2, even though I only played all the way through it once, maybe twice. And since I enjoyed the first two games so much, I got the third game as soon as it came out. So what do I remember? I remember that I played through the game. I know that over the years, every time I pick it up and try to replay the first stage, I have no interest in playing any more stages. But I was hanging out with a friend recently, and she was going on and on about her love of the Super Nintendo game, Donkey Kong Country 3, and it got me really excited to play the Donkey Kong Land games again. Now, even though the three Game Boy games look and feel very similar to the Super Nintendo games, they are different games. Uh, all the stages in the Game Boy games are either remixed versions of the Super Nintendo games or are completely new stages. Alright, so I've been meaning to give this game a second chance for a while now. So, for the first time in 25 years, I played through Donkey Kong Land 3. And, in my opinion, it's fine. It's a perfectly average side-scroller that unfortunately is hindered by a few things. So first is the graphics. Uh, I think I know what the developers were going for. So the first Donkey Kong Land game tried to replicate the stunning pre-rendered graphics of the Super Nintendo game, and I think they did a great job. But in doing so, they ended up with predominantly dark character sprites on a dark, very busy background. At times, it was pretty tricky to make out what was going on on the screen. So to try and correct this issue, they decided that all of the character sprites will be made up of only the three darker shades of gray. And the backgrounds are mostly made from the lighter grays, uh, and in addition to that they are way less busy looking. Uh, the result is that it's still really hard to distinguish what's going on, but now it's also really ugly. Uh, the series went from being a really special looking Game Boy game to kind of a bland, generic looking platformer. And if you want to see what a game looks like that was designed beautifully for the Game Boy, uh, check out the Kirby's Dreamland games. Or Operation C. Or for something a little more, like, less cartoony, uh, Ninja Gaiden Shadow. Uh, the Game Boy can display graphics that are beautiful and easy to distinguish, even with a tiny, dim, four-color screen. Uh, but no matter how cool the pre-rendered graphics look, if you can't make out what's going on, then the player is going to have a bad time. Alright, as for the game design in Donkey Kong Land 3, uh, after hearing so many amazing things about the Super Nintendo game, uh, like the clever level design, and the special events, and the secrets on the world map, I had really high hopes for this game. But what I got isn't the Super Nintendo game on the Game Boy. Instead, it really feels like Donkey Kong Land 2 Part 2. The same game engine, the same graphics, the same map, and sub-map layout. This is Donkey Kong Land 2, but with new stages. And they're not particularly special stages, just a new jungle stage, a new water stage, a new mountain stage. Let's put this enemy here in this place, another enemy here in this other place. It's cookie cutter. It's making more stages so that they'll have more stages. I think the developers tried to mix things up a bit by adding branching sections in some stages. Uh, at times, you'll have a choice of where to go next in a stage. Uh, but the problem is, it isn't fun. It just makes me stressed that I miss something, so I end up visiting every path every time. And if I'm doing that, it's no different than if they had just made it a linear single path anyway. Now, I was trying to figure out why the branching paths bothered me so much in this game and not in other games. Uh, one reason is that in this game, every stage has up to three hidden collectible items uh, that are needed to beat the game. Which means I can't leave any path unexplored. It's not like finding a hidden path would get me a 1-up or a bunch of bananas or something. No. 
I need these collectibles to be able to play the final one-sixth of the entire game. Also, the branching paths aren't presented as optional or extra or anything. No, I'll be walking through a stage and then BAM! I now have three directions I can go uh, in with no indication of which path I should take. Alright, so I just I'm gonna try them all. Uh, most of the secrets are not cleverly hidden. There are tons of places in the game where there's a bunch of bananas in the shape of an arrow telling you where to go, or in many situations, the opposite of where you should go. Seriously, the game teaches the player very quickly that if you see bananas in the shape of an arrow, go in the opposite direction to find a secret. It's kind of boring. Now ideally, the level design will guide the player where to go next, and small clues will tell the player where a secret may be hiding. For example, seeing three uh, pits in a row, but if I look closely, I can see the one in the middle has a banana near the bottom of it, leading the player to a secret. But in this game, many of the secrets are very poorly choreographed to the player. Uh, that really bothered me at first, until I realized you can pay money to these bear characters on the map screen, and they'll give you clues about where to find the secrets you've missed. It was pretty cool. Uh, but in some cases, guarantees that you'll need to play stages more than once, which can be tedious. <sighs> okay, let's see, what else is there? Oh my goodness, the map screens! They have this pointless little quirk to them. Okay, so check this out. There's a world map screen where you select which area to enter. And then, in that area, you select the stage to play, right? So you're playing the game. Uh, and then you get to Wrinkly Kong's Save Cave, which is the only spot in an area uh, that you can save. Whatever. Uh, then you keep playing, uh, you get to the end of an area and fight the boss, and you win! And this sends you back to the world map, so you can enter the next area. But the problem is, I want to save my game, because, you know, I just beat a boss. If I continue to the next area, then I won't be able to save my game until I play even more stages and make it to the next save cave. But, I can go back into the area that I just beat, travel to the save cave, and save my game there. But, I now have no way to get back to the world map. Now I could fight the boss again, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Or, I think I can go to the bear shop, and if you have money, you can pay to warp to another area. But the easiest thing to do is to just turn off the Game Boy and turn it back on again, and then select the world I want to go to. There really is no reason for this, especially in a portable pick-up-and-play game. The game should automatically save after every stage, like in Super Mario Land 2. And simply pressing the B button should bring the player back to the world map screen. The only consequence to the way the map screens were actually implemented is that it wastes the player's time. As for extra lives, uh, once again they're mostly pointless. Uh, it's not too tricky to unlock the save cave once you get to a new area, and once you do that, you can save your game after every stage you finish. If you die, it sends you back to the title screen, where you can load your save game and continue playing the stage you were just playing. So once again, the only consequence to the extra live system is that it just wastes the player's time. <sighs> the bosses are boring and ugly. Uh, beating them is just memorizing their attack patterns. Uh, as for the character Kitty Kong, I know he's not very popular. Personally, I don't really mind him. I just wish I got to play as Donkey Kong instead, but whatever. Alright, so I've talked a lot about the things I didn't like in this game. Uh, the graphics that are boring and difficult to distinguish, uh, uninspired level design, and choices that waste the player's time. But, all things considered, I really did enjoy playing through this game again. After I finished playing a set of stages and I saved and you know turned off the game for the night, I looked forward to when I got to play the game next time. The music is ported from the Super Nintendo game, and is generally nice to listen to. Uh, the difficulty level was good. Many of the stages were challenging, but never so much that they stopped me from progressing in the game. Uh, the gameplay loop of finding bear coins, paying to get a hint on how to find a secret, and then entering the stage to get the secret is a fine idea. 
Uh, even though the game is nothing really special, it is more portable Donkey Kong, which in general is a good thing. I really think a lot of my complaints come from the fact that I'm always comparing it to the previous two Donkey Kong Land games. I just had such a fun time playing them, and Donkey Kong Land 3 offers nothing new at best, and at worst is a step back. It all just adds up to a basic, rather bland, forgettable side-scroller. Now, about the ending. Why couldn't I remember if I'd beaten the game or not? Well, I found out why. So, the game has five worlds to play through, right? And at the end of World 5, you have a battle with the final boss named K. Rule. Uh, if you beat him, he escapes into a secret sixth world that you can only enter after collecting all the secrets. After you do all that, you battle K. Rule again. And if you beat him again, well, I was expecting like any sort of satisfying end to K. Rule, but instead, you get like a cutscene with some cartoonish dialogue where K. Rule whines about, Nyeh, you pesky Kongs, you foiled me again. Nyeh. See if you can beat my time trials? Okay, so this is where I left off 25 years ago. I hate time trial stages because I'm terrible at them. I gave them all a try, but yeah, I was not having fun at this point. <laughs> uh, I did want to see the ending though, so I cheated and looked up online what happens if you beat them. Uh, and what do you get? You get a single screen that says, Congratulations! Game completed! <laughs> That's it. No Donkey Kong, no Diddy Kong, no resolution with K. Rule. It's an unsatisfying ending to an unsatisfying game. Also, I just wanted to mention, uh, getting to the fabled secret Lost World is supposed to be this big deal, but then when you get there, there's Wrinkly Kong in her save cave, <laughs> just like she is in every other area in the game. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> I thought nobody knew about this place. <laughs> now I know it's just a video game, but it kind of annoyed me. <laughs> oh, one thing that really impressed me about this game is the special effects they added for the weather. So one thing that made the original Donkey Kong Country game for the Super Nintendo so impressive was the rain and snow special effects. Uh, sadly, none of that got implemented on the Game Boy, at least until Donkey Kong Land 3. Uh, it's not nearly as impressive, but it is there. And I love stuff like this. Uh, by my count, this is one of only four Game Boy games that have a snow or rain special effect. So that's pretty cool. It looks like they implemented the snowflakes by using OAM sprites. Uh, the Game Boy can only handle 40 sprites on screen at a time, which is not a lot. And that doesn't include other limitations that can cause flickering. So to have six sprites dedicated to falling snowflakes, plus the processing need to animate them on the screen, is a great achievement. I wish more Game Boy games had effects like that. Alright, now I'd like to take a moment and speculate a little about the development of this game. So this game was released in 1997. In 1997, <laughs> the Sony PlayStation had already been out for three years, and even the Nintendo 64 was already out for like a year. Uh, game developers had largely, largely moved on to making 3D games at this point, including the company Rare for the Nintendo 64. And video game development was moving on from the primitive assembly language to the easier to manage C and C++ programming languages. Now, once again, I'm just speculating, but Rare had to find developers that could make a game on a clunky old portable console from 1989, while all the main development was being done on their big new 3D games. But they still had the source code for Donkey Kong Land 2, uh, yeah, all these things put together, I can easily imagine how Donkey Kong Land 3 ended up feeling like basically a remix of Donkey Kong Land 2 with some new stages. So, in conclusion, yeah, Donkey Kong Land 3 is fine. There are many worse games for the Game Boy, 
but even when I am in the mood to play a Donkey Kong Land game, I'd rather just play the first game again, or maybe the second game. Donkey Kong Land 3 is a game that exists because people were expecting it to exist, not because it needed to. Ugh, I'm gonna end this video with one last thing. The minecart stages. Oh my goodness, they're so bad. Like, oh, I don't even know what to say. They made me so angry. I know they're a staple of the series, but they either need to be reworked for the Game Boy or just left out completely. Huh. <sighs>